Right, uh, now it's not long to go. It was a couple of months now. I think it might be two months today even that COP26, uh, the climate change talks, get underway in Glasgow. Uh, of course, um, UK hosting them. Uh, but a new report from the uh, right-leaning Adam Smith Institute and the British Conservation Alliance argues that free markets must play a role in addressing environmental challenges. Uh, they've got uh, some ideas on how market-based policies can help achieve the UK's environmental goals. Here to explain how it might work, uh, one of the report's authors, Connor Tomlinson, uh, from the British Cons Conservation Alliance. Hi, Connor. Morning, Matt. I was going to open with an ABBA pun, but one of your wise viewers just stole the uh, government policy for last year being, does your mother know that you're out from me? So I'm going to I'm going <laughs> to pretend that my, my ego isn't deflated after that one. Uh, it's not bad. I mean, it's, I mean it's, it's the same song, but a different joke. So we'll allow that. We'll allow that. Um, so uh, um, explain what when you what do we mean by market based policies what, as an alternative to what when it comes to solving the climate crisis? Well, currently, the environmental debate is flanked on both sides by, as was already spoken about in your earlier segment about New Zealand, um, the ev evil of eco-fascism and the radicals on the far left of things like Extinction Rebellion and the eco-socialists. And the present Conservative government, um, their, their approach seems Conservative in name only, as seen with the income tax rises today to pay for the social spending. They're taking a very similar approach to climate change in that they're dumping massive amounts of taxpayer money into solutions that are going to be mired in bureaucracy and ultimately the taxpayer is going to be on the hook for when those schemes go wrong. I know Rishi Sunak was speaking to Andrew Neil on his GB News show and said, oh, it's about a billion, but don't worry, I'm a fiscal conservative because I know it's not my money I'm spending. Well, I think I'd be quite happy to spend it more wisely myself, thank you very much. And so to get the taxpayer uh, out of the burden of paying for all of these, these schemes, which are going to ultimately run into a brick wall and have a lot of potholes, instead we value a market-based approach, which empowers the entrepreneurs and the innovators to internalise the risks and ultimately internalise rewards with a profit incentive for innovating our way out of environmental issues, be it climate change, clean air, clean water, whatever comes up for, for, for our benefit. And that means that not only do the consumers, the taxpayers, benefit from all of the environmental things, but they also benefit from all the economic things that we're recovering from lockdown. Isn't the problem, though, that if you leave it to the market, that's what got us into this mess, that uh, actually the market left to its own devices uh, carries on polluting because there's a profit there. The, you know, to the, sh the move to uh, low-carbon technologies is more expensive. And so if you're entirely market-driven, you're going to avoid doing that because if you're entirely motivated by profit, uh, then it's just not going to happen, is it? I disagree with that entirely, uh, primarily because... Well, why hasn't, I mean, it, happened, a, why hasn't it happened then? Because, because it, well, it, actually is, it actually is currently happening. And the uh, to say that the market is the leading uh, cause of pollution is incorrect because it's actually been it's government partnerships with things like oil monopolies, which is why we've embroiled ourselves in overseas conflicts. Or, for example, the Guardian turning around and saying, oh, 100 of the world's largest companies are responsible for about 70% of the emissions. We at BCA have actually done a little bit of research on that that we're hoping to release soon. We've found that at least 98 of those 100 companies benefit directly from government subsidies. So it's it's a state partnership which, uh, which keeps these polluting practices in the case. Whereas, for example, there's a, there's a shareholder director, I forget the business council's name exactly, but they've got quite a lot of people on their board. And they said, to create a sustainable market, um, to, to create a sustainable industry, we'll prolong our profit incentive out into the future because you won't have uh, property damage or loss of talent from, from a, a home and abroad uh, due to environmental issues. So sustainability is a corporate directive um, and it's in our self-interest if we want to just keep making profit. I said, I, I, I'll be honest. I'm sorry. I'm slightly struggling with it. So you're saying that the government is the government is subsidising the the pollution. Is that what you're suggesting? In many respects, yes. Over here, we don't actually have direct fossil fuel um, subsidies because right, so I, I explained this in the paper. But we do have the indirect rate of uh, fossil fuels benefiting from the same uh, lower VAT rate as things like renewables. Um, so that's one of the ways that, that could be uh, eliminated to incentivise uh, greater investment and innovation into alternative fossil technologies. But it is, it isn't the truth that what's happened, and so interesting is with wind, a few years ago, wind power was incredibly expensive. The government uh, heavily subsidised it. It massively, massively brought down the cost. And now it makes up a, a sizable chunk of our, of our energy production. And that is uh, recognising that the, the uh, industry was not going to invest in wind on its own. Uh, government subsidy went in and then wind production's gone up. That is, that is uh, the role of the government, isn't it? To, to try and uh, bring about the greater good, as they would see it, of, of uh, lowering uh, carbon emissions, uh, but using public money to do so where the market just isn't doing it. 
I disagree entirely because I don't think it's the role of any government to legislate a utopian outcome because once you legitimise one utopian outcome for the government to do, they can use any sort of power they, that, they hang on, see oh, fit. Hang on, hang on. Isn't yeah. that what every government does? Every government legislates to make the country that they're running better. They, uh, whether or not you call that a utopian outcome or not, that's just... That's just yeah, but better, better is better is better is relative, Matt. And the issue is the uh, the overreach of power, which they can believe they can justify it, these outcomes. And if you're going to say, for example, that a lot of governments do that, then I'm going to take issue with a lot of governments on on principle. Yeah, but, is instead, it, but isn't that the nature of government? Governments say we or in an election campaign, a party, various parties say this is how we're going to make the country better. They get elected, mm. and then that's their that's what they set out to do. And we can argue about whether or not they achieve it necessarily. But to say that governments shouldn't uh, uh, legislate for a utopian outcome or an improvement in the country, that's just how democracy works, isn't it? Yeah, but it's, it's, it's how. And whether or not it's a principled first approach, like microenvironmentalism is, as I explained in the introduction, I encourage people to read the paper, versus a sort of utilitarian approach which doesn't put a, a limit on the actions which are legitimate for, for governments to take. It's like saying the watchman state versus the uh, the guiding hand state. Where uh, Microenvironmentalism takes very much the approach of the liberal watchman state in the sort of Lockie and uh, Adam Smith tradition. Okay, well, uh, thanks for that. That's Connor Tomlinson, uh, one of the, uh, the report's authors uh, from the British Conservation Alliance. Uh